Hello, 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 hello. Alex Hill, please report to the front. Sasha White, please report to the front. Dr. Nadezhda Webb, who just disappeared, was standing next to me. Please report to the front. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. So I sit here before you all with, um, as us, as a community, um, on behalf of your, who owns Black Data One, I believe. Um, conveners, thank you all so much. Can we have a round of applause for everybody who actually made it and came and spoke and hung out and has been doing the work for who knows how long and also just for a little bit, which is also really important. Tanika Berkeley's here. That's really important. Hi. Um, so we are here. We wanted to leave this as the last session. Um, where do we go from here? What's next? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, we are going to, because we very much believe in the power of this conversation and the power and knowledge that everybody is in this room, um, we want to make this as open as possible. Um, if I am lucky, we will talk very little. Um, if we are a little bit less lucky, Alex Hill will talk a lot. <laughs> so, do not... <laughs> let's, um, let's open it up. We've had panels on slavery, data, and reparations. Um, and as I think we probably saw, all the panels spoke a little bit to all three of those topics. Let the hands raise and begin. The queue is open for whoever has questions and queries. And we have already begun. I love it. Ellie is over here. Um, thank you, Ellie Palazzolo, co-project manager with Curious Black Louisiana and digital curation fellow with Curious Black Louisiana. Brilliant, Ooh. brilliant scholar. Ow. Mary Elliott. Hi, yes, thank you. This, was, this has been amazing. And I actually have a technical question. Um, everyone's presentations have been phenomenal. And um, I wonder if anyone can speak to um, the design aspect of your websites. If there are any designers here, um, or how you went about choosing your design team. I know that we have our digital features at the museum, um, and we're very conscientious about um, who we selected, their approach to design. And so I wondered if anyone could speak about that. Do any of the projects want to respond? And my students know I'm good for a popcorn, so please do not stand on ceremony. Elise Mitchell. Um, so I'll respond. I'm currently collaborating with a digital designer who is one that I, like I'll be full disclosure since we're family here, is, is one that I'm related to. But she, um, she's grounded in digital design practices that emanate from the Caribbean specifically and that emanate in the Black Atlantic and has specifically studied black digital design as well as visual psychology to understand how people interact with those interfaces. So as I go over the elements of the website that I'm building and also formally like bring her on as a designer to hire her, I'm constantly thinking about how can the design elements be, or asking questions like how can the design elements be accountable to the histories of the and the visual cultures of the people that I'm representing in this database. So that all the way from the ground up, it's always, um, for lack of better words, to quote Stephanie Smallwood, accountable to the enslaved in some form or fashion. Other folks, lots of projects and lots of design ideas and principles. Tatiana Esch. <laughs> With all this data, the, the idea of design doesn't matter. It does. Um, Let's use the mic. Let's use the mic. Yeah, unsil unsilencing and remains, I think, are both projects. As someone who's curating in a museum, I find it hard to believe that with all the data you collect, yeah. that design doesn't matter. It does. And so it I would imagine everybody. someone has given it some thought. Yeah. 
and at least could speak to some of the things that you think about in terms of because you're so thoughtful about the ethics, the design should matter as well. I can say that one thing we wanted to do with Texas Freedom College Project is make sure that we weren't about trying to say this point on the map is the one point that tells the story and this is the location of the place. We didn't want to propagate that kind of tyranny of you know the way that place is defined. So when we, yes we use a story map, many people use a story map, but we tried to use plugins that allowed people to ask questions and place points on the map and then we differentiated colors, right? to say that this has been reviewed, this hasn't been reviewed, but it still matters and we're gonna leave it there. So our design was very much about how do we not, you know, try to become these traffic cops that negate people's stories and like try to leave, you know, and, and validate them taking up space, di taking up digital space and, and helping them feel confident about it. So it was all about these, you know, surveys and ways to put points on the map themselves. Celia. Um, so for Unsilenced in Slavery, one of the questions um, that I often get is, who was your web designer? Because we'd really like to use them. And I'm like, web designer? Oh, actually, we didn't have one. And that's, people have been very surprised by that answer. Um, and I think it was because of the incredible group we had and also the thoughtfulness of every single decision, which I'm sure for some, <laughs> Alex, might have been painful when I'm like, well, what? this and what about that and can we and I think also just a willingness um, one of the people who isn't here Moisir one of the things that kept me going is every time I said you know I'd really like to have this I'd really like to have that and at no time did Moisir say that's not possible mm -hmm. he would say it might take a while they're gonna have to rearrange this code and that code but so that willingness I think uh, made it all come together so anyway just to say that so you can do it without a web designer you also need really good people yeah, it's also important to, to, uh, for my students to understand uh, that a design happens in the front, but it also happens in the back. And this is, so, so when Celia says, we, we slow cook this one, it was because we were uh, torn about every pixel, but also every cell in the, in, the, in the data. Every line of code, even when we were writing code, it's like, do we write it like this or do we write it like that? And how much respect do we do it, uh, show if we do it like this or if we do like, so design is that a lot of, a lot of folks in the public don't see the design. Uh, they, they imagine design is only the color, the shapes, which are, we, we put a lot of thought into, as you, as a, but they don't see the other side of it, the hidden design, the invisible labor of the model behind it, right? Uh, Hello. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Uh, one one thing that we thought about in our travels, being in Trinidad, Cuba, Barbados, is um, access by tablet or mobile phone. Uh, that's a big design issue where people build these really beautiful sites, but they don't properly load or they don't um, don't configure well. Uh, and so we thought really um, strong, like really closely about. Um, digital design and making sure that it was transferable to mobile phones and tablets because that's how so many people in the Caribbean do access the internet. Uh, and it's often not by laptop or desktop. <laughs> you? Uh, just to add to um, ECDA, I, I think, I was thinking one of the answer, one of the reasons why I, I, I didn't initially want to answer your question is because I feel like I don't have the answer, um, which is, despite having worked on this project for low these many years. Um, and one of the reasons that, that, I, that I don't have the answer is because this, what Alex was talking about, this sort of constant decisions. Um, but I think those constant decisions are, are like the most interesting part. So one of the things that, that I'm always trying to think about how we might do is to understand the archive or an archival collection as not being inert, right? As, as it being always a site of engagement, whether it's on the back end, whether it's on the front end. Um, and some of the most exciting work we do, I think, is when, you know, when we sit down as a team and try to figure out, you know, what do we want this metadata category or not? Um, and, and why would we, why would we not? And I'm always interested in trying to figure out how we might bring the people who are using this site into that discussion or to make that discussion visible. And I don't, 
I, I don't have the answer, but I we think... We put it on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> and no, we, three watchers. Whenever we would sit down to work for two hours, we would sit down to work for two hours religiously for two years to work on the project. And we made a conscious decision not to have these discussions uh, uh, outside of the record. Because once you hear me, our light's kind, and we're making the design decisions for that only the technologists and programmers will understand what decisions we are making. But we wanted to make sure that every single conversation we had was recorded so that we can remain accountable, right? Uh, yeah, so that's one way. You can film yourself talking about these things. Three watchers, <laughs> don't worry, it's super boring. <laughs> but I want to invite people into that conversation somehow. <laughs> Anthony, I don't know if you're going to say what I'm going to say, but um, maybe, uh, maybe. <laughs> let's, let's give it a shot, right? But for first blacks, you know how some institutions have miscellaneous funds? Mm. Well, I feel that mostly our projects end up with miscellaneous deficit. <laughs> And uh, what I'm trying to say is that with First Blacks, our uh, web design is a result of funds, the funds that we had, you know, cost and practicality, because you have to work with what you have many times when you embark in these projects. And there were times where in our head we had these big projects, we even had meetings and designed them and, and we had a wall with stickies and we wanted to create this interactive additional things to add to the website. But then it turned out that because we only receive a lot of in-kind support and, and internal funds, uh, now the, Insti the CUNY Dominican Studies Institute received a melon to expand the site, they will be able to add additional features. But we had to accept the fact that we needed to work with what we have. So what I'm saying is, is that the web design in some is the result of cost and practicality, and also with us accepting and trying to find someone who was willing to work with us and produce something that even though we couldn't add at the moment, but and that the back end could not support, that in the future we can add other things and that it could be enhanced, uh, of course, when the funds come. Uh, my, my, my comment is more a suggestion that a response to your question because uh, when, when working on that project, there were a lot of limitations and we had to work with what we had at hand. So basically, uh, a, a private uh, web developer was hired with the limited funding that we had. But listening to your question and after the, listening to the entire conference, what I wanted, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun in terms of uh, what, what to do next, okay? But I'm gonna throw it anyhow in case I don't have the chance. Uh, I think it would be very good for the uh, board or the organizing team of uh, uh, the conference to consider for the future either developing a, a specific initiative to compile the designing and the construction and the technological experience for future people and projects to use. Uh, uh, and uh, if not only compiling, even thinking about developing an initiative to create like, uh, what is that they call it nowadays, a hub, uh, 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 gee, what's the word, in, what's the word in English? Uh, an incubating initiative where people and groups that need the training could acquire it because it's very expensive. The, the digital designing thing is very costly. So I pose to the conference that uh, for the future, you include that as, as a purpose. Uh, uh, we, we, we do this uh, already. We're, 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 everybody here is uh, working really hard to train uh, students uh, and many of the projects already have, oh, have a pedagogical component. There are folks, uh, um, uh, Gabriel Foreman uh, uh, and the Color Conventions team uh, uh, led the way in starting to create a sort of a directory observatory 
Long-term plans include, but you need funding instead. Long-term plans include, you know, trying to eventually arrive at a place where we can do, you know, a data observatory, but also a, uh, a place where we can design policy together. A lot of what we're doing right now is laying the foundations for a conversation about policy recommendations. That includes technical specifications. So some people on YouTube were already asking, do you have metadata recommendations? Mm -hmm. What are the metadata recommendations from all other projects? We are all trying to solve, experiment so some of these questions uh, through new practices. They're being born out of this community. And the question is, who's gathering these, right? So we want to move towards that place where we have the resources, uh, create the spaces and the time for, folk, for, for our community to be able to have what you described. Uh, yeah. Did you want to add uh, Jessica? Yeah. Dr. Foreman. Um, so I, I want to thank the poets um, and the people who brought the poets. And the art spaces and the art and the color that is here then the, um, and um, and ask a question about the ways that so many of the projects themselves what happens what happens when black people own black data right um, creativity the, the genie the genealogy of creativity shows itself through and with and dancing with the data right and, and so, so many of our projects are, um, have art components. Um, I mean, like the, the, the violin that we all just were like, oh, <laughs> you know, the middle school students are eliciting art in response um, to a, an archive that denies, and here we're having um, a, a creative archive of um, what, what I call um, resurrectionary griots, right, who are preserving the work that we do, and resurrection, res um, really bringing the, this, um, this history to life as artists. How are you guys explaining this work to people who recognize our work only as digital? So when we have dance partners and visual partners and we're working with muralists, right? Our deans say, you're a center for black digital research. What's art got to do with it? So how are you making, how, how is everybody in the room making the case for the necessary enlivening art that is just part of the genealogy of this work um, as you're making case to people f for whom that's not a legible, connected, right? That's, that's what black is, is the adjective that makes it a different thing, a different compound, right? So, so I'd, I'd love some, some help and feedback at how we explain that to, to people who don't get it right away. And I, and I, I hope other people respond, but I do want to um, say there's a link there between that question, query, comment, and um, Dr. Acosta's question also, or comment back, about where are the resources to make sure that the projects are responsive in exactly those ways dancing with data is going to now run in my head. See, this is why Dr. Foreman is, damn. Um, and I also want to make sure that I shout out, and the video has been running both in the B-side as well as on break time, um, Soraya Jean-Louis, who is the artist. Can I have a round of applause in case she's watching? <laughs> who could not make it, but is the artist who allowed us to utilize her work, was in, has always been very enthusiastic, was a DSL community fellow, um, and is Haitian born, living in New Orleans. So it's literally grounded in some of the work of the projects here, and, um, and so I just wanna make sure that her name is also here in this room, so. Um, so, we were, I mean, we were a little subversive in this. I feel almost weird saying this because I know it's going up on YouTube because I'm giving away some tactics. Um, but, and I, and I also want to want to mention uh, Jess Nash and uh, Levi Ann Naidu, who were the artists, the visual artists who 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 put together um, key, I mean, amazing material, the cover of Uprising Resistance and several pieces inside. But I mean, we. In our funding from, from through Black Beyond Data for Underwriting Souls, we had funding for, for this, but to secure it further in the proposal and collaboration agreement, a legal agreement between Johns Hopkins and Lloyd's, we this was it was part of it. Um, so <laughs> you know, we could hold Johns Hopkins accountable 
um, as the institution ourselves to to maintain that responsibility because it's part of what what we were what we were bringing. We're often told that's a different program officer, right. right? You know, so when we bring all of the elements of the project together, it no longer fits in any of the program officer funding models, right? And so I guess I'm asking the question not only about deans but about funders, right? Because because it's not legible to the categories that um, that often allow us to have funding. Yeah, I can say really quick that my 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 new gambit at Yale University. I just started working there. Uh, and I opened this space uh, that I'm directing called the Creative Forum, and everything digital that I will do will just be flipped as creative. So I'm gonna try to just get funding for creative, and then I can bring in everything. I'll let you know if it works. But crea creative for, uh, the, the, the naming is purposely trying to solve this problem. Uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Uh, first of all, amazing to be here. I've, I've learned so much with, you know, when you come to something like this, you realize how much you don't know. So that's been very powerful. Um, I want to recommend, based upon what I've seen today, uh, my background's in data engineering and a lot of data platform development. But I think that, that there are four uh, centers of gravity that I want to recommend, right? Number one is the user experience, the UX. Number two is data engineering. And distinguish that from data science and distinguish that from content, which is data. So I think that what I see is an opportunity to start to create those groups from this meeting moving forward, mm -hmm. because they all require different disciplines, mm -hmm. and they all require equal uh, attention, but more a lot of conversation. Mm -hmm. And I saw a lot of hints of that today in every presentation, and I think there's an opportunity to really not work in, I don't want to say your silos, but there's a there's an opportunity to work as a network. And the power is in the network of the room and the brands in the room coming together amongst those four different centers of gravity. So, so you have user experience, right, which is gonna be your visual, however, the, however it's used, however it's experience, your data engineering, which is how you're going to house the data, move the data, the data sciences, which are gonna be your analytics, and then how you interpret that, that data, and then the data itself is gonna be your content. Because that's, that's really what this is all about. It's about the data. I, I'm going to um, uh, add to what you just said, uh, that uh, the possibility that we can train students to incorporate several of those at the same time. I have a the web designer for, for on science and slavery, if you want to call me that, is me. I have a PhD in English. I study French poetry in the 20th century in the Caribbean. And With a book uh, coming out soon. Thank you. <laughs> Plug. <Right. Gotta> cover. <laughs> the, uh, and, and the idea is I am trying to tell my students, listen, if we have to separate these concerns all the time, we stand to lose in the long term. In fact, a lot of our, our inability to hold on to the power and control and design of the data happens when we depend on somebody else to do the technical part, to do the engineering part. So I have to really try, I don't know if we're gonna succeed, but we have to try to train a new generation to be both and, both and. Not just a humanist, but somebody who can do many of the other things you're describing. And it's not only data engineering and all these things, it's also art, music, poetry has to be a part of the combination. Well, you're not gonna get these kinds of experiments and creativity if you don't start combining these things. I, I was just gonna say um, that that's a very tall order, Alex, and, I I, I, and it sounds great. Um, however, we have not figured that out yet, but what we have figured out is that there are um, tremendous benefits when having the digital team, right, or the, the data scientist, the software engineer, and the quote scholars, the humanists, whatever, in the same, literally in the same meetings and all the same meetings, and having the you know our, our software engineers, um, now software engineers I should say, uh, come to the descendant engagement events, right? Um, because I I have seen firsthand what happens when um, the programmers are not in the conversations about ethics, and it doesn't look good. And then I see this other side of the room, real quiet, except for Dr. Foreman has spoken. Don't be shy. Not really. Don't be shy. Come on. Um, Go ahead. 
Well, this is Mary um, with the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. And full transparency, I um, curated and did the content for our searchable museum feature. And um, Dr. Johnson was the scholarly advisor, one of them. The other was Martha Jones, Dr. Martha Jones. Yes. And um, Dr. Johnson played a pivotal role, and I'm hoping she might um, speak to this, that we sat in meetings with the design team, and what you said, Alex, it's not just knowing the historical content, but having a, a bird's eye view so that even if you don't do, I'm so glad you said the UX, because even, if, even though I don't understand the technical aspect of all of that, I understand the technical aspect of all of that. In terms of, I need to know how is, how is my audience going to engage with this? Thank you for mentioning the phone, because how am I going, how are elderly people, how are folks who don't know how to use the computer all the time, but know how to use their phone, how are they going to engage with this? How are they gonna access all this data that you did, how are they gonna get it, right? How do they navigate through the computer? And it's easier for them to navigate through the computer. It's not difficult. And when I ask that question about the design team, sometimes you get a design team that just assumes, well, everyone knows how to do this. Well, everyone doesn't. And so you have to understand and be able to convey that to your design team. And then when it comes down to the images that are on the sites, all of that, that's very important too, to be able to say, no, this is the feeling I'm trying to convey. You have to understand all of that. So, um, and, and Jessica saw how all of that unfolded and played a pivotal role in having a voice in that. I won't add much there, just you said it. <laughs> um, I also think to that point, releasing desires around sort of like this high tech vision um, when I was at Vanderbilt, something that we did was that we built a telephony system so that seniors could dial in to record their, or their oral histories. Um, and I think thinking about access before, like privileging access before, you know, these, well, UX research, like all of these other things, um, sometimes it looks like going to the lowest, the lowest possibility, quote unquote, the lowest possibility, but like the closest to the ground that actually matches the experiences, right, of those that you're trying to include. And I think, you know, when we're thinking about inclusion, that's really what we're thinking about. All of these other things, they're nifty and they're cool, but if they don't meet this basic close to the ground thing, then really it's an impediment. It gets in the way. It doesn't do the work. Yeah, I, 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 if you allow me, I want to internationalize the conversation a little bit, uh, bracket the way that we access uh, the internet in the United States, uh, a, a little bit be, uh, dedicated an, an inordinate amount of time in the past 10 years uh, in conversations developing a concept we call minimal computing, which is trying to be aware of the ways in which the, uh, we access these things in different socio-technical environments. So sometimes it's that you don't have electricity. Sometimes it's that you don't have uh, internet or you may have it from 2 to 4 p.m. Sometimes it's that you have to buy SIM cards that have a limited amount of, this concept of like uh, uh, unlimited data, that's, a, that's an American thing, and it's not even that, uh, that old. Uh, sometimes you have censorship and government repression, something we're starting to see in the United States. We work, I worked on a project in Sudan with uh, post-independence uh, pictures of women that represented the diversity of womanhood in the nation. That went against the idea of womanhood that the government of Bashir, but before this is before the Civil War now, uh, had. And we had to design a project that lived on the internet w as a censored object, and one that circulated in hard drives in the University of Khartoum uh, with the full collection. Right, so, so this is something that I encourage everybody in the audience to th not think of the internet and access as this universal uh, symmetric platform, and that we just have to achieve that. No, we have to be aware of our context, where we are, and and don't only think that the way that we're going to do uh, to to uh, 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 to steward black data in the future is if it's accessible on the internet. Um, 
have a question, sorry. Yeah, go. I have a question related to this, which is about the people whose projects are engaged in, are doing community engagement. Right. I'm wondering how you non-hierarchically engage with descendant communities, um, because I'm, I guess I am currently at a place where I'm very comfortable engaging with an international research community around this project, but there's something to be said of the hidden power dynamics of being someone at a well-funded U.S. institution, coming to people who do not have those same resources and telling them their history. I'm, I'm, I'm reticent about that. So I'm wondering how people who are doing this community engagement work find common ground, find non-hierarchical strategies for engaging with descendant communities and wider communities. We got two responses and then I think probably Summer also has, um, uh, really quickly, has something in there too. Really quickly on that and something I've learned from um, Gabrielle Foreman over there is stating your principles um, and repeatedly stating them before you engage such as one of our big principles is don't go where you're not invited. Um, which, you know, from the urban planning field, that's like the opposite of what we do. So I'm very much teaching students that whatever we're doing, yes, we're doing this survey project, but it emerges out of one, something descendants asked me for. They wanted their, their information aggregated this way. And then also when and where we do that aggregation in person, we're doing it in a way that is about reciprocity, meaning there is something that they want, some kind of archival project, something that they're doing that overlaps with what you're trying to do. And so then it's about reciprocity. Um, and so I think those principles are a big part of it. And then also realize the converse happens is that I have very deep, strong relationships with a lot of descendant communities around the state of Texas, but that also means that they, they have a strong sense of how to work with me and how to get what they need and want. So it works both ways. Jenny or Breeze. Okay, all right. Um, I was just gonna say, because uh, this is obviously something that has come up a lot, uh, one, of, one of the uh, sort of frameworks that we've ad adopted is not to think of it as inviting, right? Not, you're, you don't in, we, we're trying not to invite communities or invite individuals to, to participate in our project, right? Because that's actually not what we're trying to do. Um, and, we, and similarly, we don't actually seek out individuals who we know um, may have, for example, ancestors in the database because it's a complicated thing to contact somebody and give them information they didn't ask for and they don't know you. Um, and so for us, that has meant adopting a, a broad definition of the term descendant to include people who um, identify ancestors in the record that we've created, but also people who just feel connected to the history of slavery. Um, and that, that leaves you know, room for, for broad inclusion um, and then the invitation that we make is actually, again, not an invitation, but um, an ask to build something together rather than um, an ex extractive ask to give, the, give us their knowledge for our little project, right? Um, but as I think I said earlier, this is, it's hard um, to constantly um, try to implement that shared authority, I would say, because it actually means you have to move really slowly, which is one of the things that I personally find difficult um, because you have to wait till the relationships are in place, wait until you actually um, have informed decisions from descendant communities before you just move ahead, which is something I, I really credit Yola personally, who's not here, but for teaching me. Breeze, do you wanna? Yes. Um, is she, um, the question was, do, is there a point where we cede authority? Absolutely, I would think that that is um, a foundational ethic of, of Kinfolkology that, uh, certainly, uh, and for one example, would be the data itself. Um, we, we don't want to have stewardship of the data forever. We are trying to shift that. Um, yeah, so I guess when we say we're building Canfocology together, we, we want to serve in the ways in which we are necessary. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of ways in which, yeah, we are taking our cues not from ourselves. I, wanna, I wanted to add that um, maybe in short, I think about relationality, and I really try to position myself. In my other research, um, I'm working on a sort of hybridized genre of experimental ethnography that includes autoethnography and um, poetry. Um, and I study black women, black matriarchs in the US broadly, but the women in my own family in particular. And so um, 
there's never a point, there's no amount of times I could talk about ontoepistemology uh, and forget that my grandmother is my grandmother when I'm in the field. <laughs> um, earlier, I didn't want to take a picture because I'm awkward sometimes, and Dr. J was like, get in this picture, and I was like, okay. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> um, and so as uh, my research population sort of broadens, it broadens in relationship to, the, to my, my uh, mother, my great aunt, and my grandmother in particular, right? And so when I'm sitting with a family member now who I, don't, I haven't met before doing this work, um, I, I connected with her through my great aunt. It doesn't uh, change, I don't know. I, I'm very much an implement of my own work. And I think somehow in, the, in that subjectivity, I'm getting at a methodology that feels okay for me in anthro. Mm. Sorry, I have one more recommendation, which is you don't have to meet at the institutions, right? Like, so for our first event um, is gonna be in Richmond and we're meeting at a locally owned, uh, a black owned um, restaurant that is as far away from UVA as possible. <laughs> um, because yeah, it's, it's um, if, if you're actually trying to partner with communities, you need to go um, where you can. UVA ers are laughing. <laughs> can I get? Um, a, let's I work keep at UVA, in. <laughs> Dr. Hamilton. So I was actually going to circle back to the conversation a few minutes ago about user interface and about design, um, and just to add a couple of things. So when I started working with the center, um, so I had had experience with user interface with business processes. That's what I did, like in my former life. Um, and so and I always practice what I call emp um, very empathetic design and thinking about the user. But when I got to the center, one of the things I was like, oh, y'all care, care, right? It was like another, it was like another level. Um, and so when I would help to design, for example, the transcription project, you know, it seemed easy. I was like, yeah, I got this, you know, so, duh, duh, duh. and so, but Jim Casey was like, yeah, actually, no. Um, and so that was, so that pushback, you know, I mean, he said it very nicely, but it was like a pushback to, to sort of say like, this is what we need. And the way that that, the way I learned that was actually through hearing, learning what was a transcription for, and the, what I call, I call people users, because that's what I was trained to do, right? So who are the users? And so he would kind of bristle, you know, at that term, right? Because these are transcribers. And then I met, actually, through Zoom, some of the people who would be transcribing, and some of the, like there was an elderly woman, and so we went through the transcription as I'm on the, the call with her, and she gives me feedback directly. And so that, you know, and I had to think about that, and who are the people, and what is the work that we're doing, and why are we doing this work? And I had to buy in, which I did. And so I think that if you're, when you're hiring, when you're thinking about who works with you, you want to make sure that there is that buy-in, that there's the listening, and then also how do you show that you care, care? So like we show, so the, we now, right, the center, we show through our principles, we show through um, the ways that we direct, connect directly with the community, not just talking about, but like talking to, visiting, speaking with. So I think making sure that the people that you work with, um, whoever they are, that there is buy-in. If, uh, if, if, if I may, here's one of our challenges when it comes to that. Yes, many of us have to uh, hire teams. Uh, we don't have the time, the space, but we also have the opportunity to be able to hire teams. And, and many of those collaborations actually have wonderful you know, uh, endings uh, or continuations, as it, the case may be. But it's taking UX, for example, as a term. I think, if, for example, you guys are familiar with the genre that we call now university studies. That genre was, uh, in the words of my son, or my youngest, hella white until very recently, right? We're starting to see some interventions there. UX is hella white. The concept itself developed around an idea of the user that we could call the universal white man of the enlightenment. Uh, even though studies are done that compilate how people click and stuff like that, most of the participants in these studies are the same person. And this is why then I encourage all of us not to take, uh, right now I'm in a stage in which I just want us to question everything. Question international standards, question terms, question everything as it's been handed down to us, just question it right first. Say no first before you say yes. And then sometimes the answer will be, you know what, in order for me to do this right, I'm not gonna be able to do it by hiring some, somebody. Yeah. I mean, we made it a question of who owns black data on purpose. It's a question, right? And so how do we mobilizing questions to really kind of fight the sort of status quo 
or the kind of default <laughs> operating system of everything, whether it's funding, whether it's academia, whether it's humanities, whether it's data science, social science, whatever it might be, these are things that are built off of um, structures that maybe we've got to ask some serious questions about, and what does that look like when we do? Jennifer Morgan has the mic. Oh, it's a question, though, a new question. It's a, Is that okay? It's a new question. All right. um, well, not that new. Um, so <laughs> it actually, uh, I was thinking um, in the conversation about the unsilencing slavery site, uh, Alex, I think you said that part of the emergence of that flower, that, that visual, was about ref the refusal of the aggregate, right? Like that we, and that everyone in the room was like, absolutely, we've all encountered the violence of, um, of, uh, of aggregating data. Mm -hmm. I wondered though, how or if you all, those of you who've, who've done these projects, are telling the folks who are using the website about the violence of aggregation, right? Like, so I can see the practice of, of disaggregating and refusing, right? I can see it in the Flower of Rose Hall. I can see it um, in the Kinfolkology uh, conversation. I can see it all over. But I wonder if you're introducing the folks who are using these websites to why it's so important to do this differently. Yes. I'll answer really quick for hours and then I'll pass the mic. I want to hear some of the other answers. But uh, something that is that belongs to, to, I would say, I want to say more than half of my projects, especially definitely the past five or six years, something that I try to do consistently is to publish autocritiques along with my projects. And these autocritiques, we take the opportunity to say, you know, we're trying to do this. And, uh, and but here's how we think we're failing. Mm. And here's how, Here's where, where, where the, the, there might be illu optical illusions, that you may see something in the map, you may see something in the, in the graphic that we did not want to put there, but that it's just in the nature of graphical language that these things may, may happen. And um, in fact, we all wrote, the, the main team that we're agreeing, we all wrote our pieces, yeah, we all wrote reflections, and I have to say, I'm the one who believes that this does not, that, that I don't think we succeeded. And I'm the, I'm the most negative voice in the, in the, in the, in the reflections. I don't think, I, I'm still in doubt mm. about whether what we set out to do, which was to bring back the humanity to, uh, to, to the people who got dehumanized through datafication, you know? So that is the, a recommendation for, for, that I think for, for my students here in the room. Uh, 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 Autocritique is key. Uh, yeah. PR, oh, Celia. Celia and then PR, sir. I, I want to get back to the accessibility and also to something you just said, Alex, um, and that I think it's, a, it's throughout in terms of the user, right? So when I started writing the book, I actually had a couple of childhood friends from Jamaica read it. Um, and they couldn't get through it. They were like, it's just too painful. I cannot, I don't know how you write this kind of thing. Um, and so partly it was about, uh, uh, and I also am very fortunate to have many, many friends who have nothing to do with academia. Uh, and I think it's important, I mean, at every stage Shout with out the to website them. too, that was important to have people, and they were able to access it easier than the book just because of the depth of the pain, right? Um, and violence is in the book. Um, so I think that, that that's important throughout any time that you're, I mean, the next thing for me is um, now making some of this accessible to younger folk, which is why I really appreciated the session yesterday, um, and working with some of the schools in Montego Bay in that era. I've already reached out to my own, um, you know, preparatory school in Kingston, but thinking about that not being the end, right, but extending it. I do think that we were successful because I'm so <laughs> wound up in that and all the thousands of hours that were spent in that. Um, in terms of you know what I've seen with other websites before on silencing slavery and the, the limits to humanity and what I think we bring in terms of layers of humanity. So it's not the end, but certainly I think we made a step forward. PR Seth is got a hot mic, um, and we're beginning to wind into time. Um, I want to end with PR and two more folks who are not faculty. Students, I'm looking at you, but I'm not putting you on the spot. We got community folks here. We've got the poets. We've got artists. I see folks, yep, I see uh, Xavier. Uh, yep, we got another hot mic. 
Can we get one more? While somebody brave tries to raise their hand, I do want to reference the um, session. We did have a session um, for the project participants to gather yesterday. Um, because one of the goals that we have is we're not just asking this question. We actually do want to begin to try and answer it. And this is a long-term goal that we have decided <laughs> to try and think about how to tackle. But part of that is also setting out some criteria some terms for how to engage in slavery and data projects, ethically black-centered projects, projects that are about care and care, projects that take seriously art and design. And if we have something like that, can we take it to funders? Can we take it to deans and say, yes, I know that you have this fund over here that is miscellaneous, but actually these principles say that design is really critical to doing a project. I need to have that fund allocated over here, or I need this curriculum allocated in this way. So we have very, a very big job to do, um, and uh, we have charged our participants with being part of this adventure, I think, before they even knew that that's what they were doing. Um, but, um, but we, this is, this is, again, I keep say, saying it over and over, there, just the beginning, just the beginning. PR, now Xavier. We have, now we know that it's an honorable tradition. Hey, are, you know, Ache. <laughs> um, yes, and then one more, whoever is after Xavier, PR. I'll go really quickly. Um, I just wanted to respond very quickly to Dr. Morgan's question about uh, kind of aggregation and disaggregation. And so I mentioned a bit earlier that one of the really important things about the work that Sasha and I were doing with the Underwriting Souls Project, but Lloyd's more broadly, is that it's a market and not a company. And so I think over the, you know, over the entirety of the project, I think we got a whole host of questions about, well, why isn't there more in the Lloyd's archive, right? All these different questions about scale, right? How do we actually think about Lloyd's involvement, right? Um, and again, it, since it was a market, all of these individual actors are dispersed and scattered all across the globe, right? And so I think one of the things, as far as the aggregation and disaggregation piece, I think one of the things that we tried to really hone in with our project is saying, you know, this is a, you know, to kind of quote Sadia Hartman, right? This is a constitutive kind of messy archive, right? In so many different ways that data is messy in so many different kinds of ways, right? And so I think these were one of the things that we were kind of wrestling with, with, with archive, with our archive in particular, but I think kind of more broadly when you're thinking about questions around data and slavery, right? That they're, it's quite messy, right? When you're trying to put together projects and put together stories in these particular ways, um, that I think really kind of sheds an additional light on just, you know, what data fundamentally is kind of doing when we think about questions around black life and death, so. Xavier, Xavier Wallace, Black Testimony Project. Hi, uh, I'm asking this question on behalf of a friend. Uh, uh, their That's question, cheating. <laughs> their question is, I, I know that there have been conversations around community input, um, but what does community ownership look like in these projects? And how are folks structuring terms of agreement with institutional partners so as not to be handing over black data to colonial projects like universities and philanthropy? Mm. I, I actually have something to say on that. Yes, note. last um, one. Because I wanted to Hi. also speak to the question around um, the ethics around uh, working with communities that you're not part of. Um, so I, prior to being traumatized by the, acad the academy, I was a youth worker and a high school teacher, and I still work in the youth center. So it's a different demographic, obviously, but um, one of the youth was explaining to me, because the youth center itself became a hub for researchers. Uh, a lot of really radical work emerged from that space, for black youth in particular, and a lot of researchers were interested in their sports programs, their media program, their uh, recording studio program, and this, the youth were exhausted by research programs. Um, and oftentimes they come in with these like really fancy um, resources to, quote, give back to the community, but like they were not actually things that the youth needed um, because the youth came in tired. Um, it doesn't take, it doesn't alleviate their exhaustion from doing homework or studying for exams. Like giving them a Game Boy doesn't really do anything. Um, but to the point um, about the ethics of that is one of the youth explained to me that sometimes you just need to take our nose seriously. And as researchers, we oftentimes impose ourselves and uh, in spaces where we, we, we prioritize the, quote, importance of our research. But at the end of the day, perhaps research is not the space for it. And sometimes we have to reckon with that desire uh, and that kind of perverse, you know, kind of uh, intuition. So I think, I mean, I might be upsetting a lot of researchers in the room, um, <laughs> but like sometimes it's not about that. It's about the relationship that's built outside of the academy. So if we're always focused on 
what comes out of our academic institutions as much as, you know, can I say this on, well, uh, redirecting resources <laughs> is one way of putting it. Um, I use a different term that might put me in a very troubled situation, but it's just to say that research might not necessarily always be the space for it um, and to, say, to take their nose seriously. That seems like a really perfect place to transition. Um, hold your applause, because we are going to have our closing offering from Malachi Sargent. Please come up to the mic. Good afternoon. Are we all right? Yeah. Lovely. One of the things I think is true, which is a way of thinking about the afterlife of slavery in regard to how we inhabit historical time, is the sense of temporal entanglement, where the past, the present, and the future are not discrete and cut off from one another, but rather that we live in the simult simultaneity of that entanglement. This is almost common sense for black folk. How does one narrate that? That is a Sadia Hartman quote from 2018 that really grounded my research in Lloyd's archive. Um, and with these poems, I wanted to explore this temporal entanglement how our histories leak into the present day, and how black folk today exist in this twisted temporal haunting. Being exposed to the archives at Lloyd's, handling documents better preserved than the humanity in and of our history, served as a tangible reminder of the paradoxical existence of the African diaspora, being from the same colonial metropole that played such a crucial role in our suppression. This process drew me to convene with the ghosts of my own and others' ancestors, which, whilst affronting, reaffirmed to me that time, bodies, water, and spirits are not linear. Each is a container for time, yet time still manages to pass through it. Black folk are like time, too. We cannot be confined, being too full of potential to be static. We are limitless, and everything and nowhere all at once. I've just broken my book. I'm gonna read a poem and I'm uh, beyond grateful to be here. I'm a little bit, I'm here. <laughs> this poem is called Strike Through. Dear almighty God, if you are really there, we pray that when your wind revisits, distracted, next snap, unexpectedly as if tapped on the back by new destinies. We pray for the heat of guilt and pressure to marry, walk in the devils down the aisle to the tune of their own failed abortion, for we prevailed. Let us be merry at their expense like they do us, O oh Lord. We lust to drink their muffled screams in shells recovered from home. If you hear us now, if you hear us now, give us just one thing. We ask for chaos. Use your hand to strike through the black dove's cage. Birth us in a new darkness. Let the air expand. Let the sea gyrate. Let the whole earth swell on this boat. The hold, like all of us here, is ready to burst. Shall we rise? Indeed. Amen. Who else like that? Uh,
know, this evening, see you guys at 6 o'clock at Nomu Nomu. There are shuttles leaving from the study starting right about now. So see you guys. Thank you all, everybody, for being here. Thank you to my co-organizers, Johns Hopkins University, Morgan State University, Mellon Foundation, Diaspora Solidarity Lab, Black Beyond Data, everybody in the thank yous, and Ancestor Spirits and everyone in memoriam. Ache. Yeah.